I posted the story of Larry and Richie Carver on July 8, 2021. In the story, I explain that Richie and his father Larry shot both Ryan Waller and Heather Kwan in the head and then burglarized their home. Heather died instantly, but Ryan survived the shooting and was arrested as a suspect in Heather's death. Ryan was held in the back of a police cruiser for about four hours before being taken back to the police station and questioned for another hour, all while Ryan still had a bullet lodged in his brain. When I put out my video about the case, Ryan's father, Don, had left a comment with some corrections about details that the media had gotten wrong. After talking to him on the phone, I decided it would be best to go meet with him in person and get accurate details from the source. It was then that I realized that there was more to the story than anybody really knew. The detective that conducted the interrogation, Detective Paul Dalton, completely failed to get Ryan the medical attention he needed. And then he lied about it in a deposition two and a half years later. Then we discovered that this was not the only time that Detective Dalton had gotten tunnel vision on the wrong person and lied under oath in order to close the case. Right now, as I make this documentary, September of 2021, the Phoenix Police Department is currently being investigated by the United States Department of Justice. On August 5, 2021, the DOJ's Office of Public Relations put out a press release that stated, quote, Attorney General Merrick B. Garland and Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark for the Civil Rights Division announced today that the Justice Department has opened a pattern or practice investigation into the City of Phoenix and the Phoenix Police Department. This investigation will assess all types of use of force by Phoenix PD officers, including deadly force. The investigation will also seek to determine whether Phoenix PD engages in retaliatory activity against people for conduct protected by the First Amendment, whether Phoenix PD engages in discriminatory policing, and whether Phoenix PD unlawfully seizes or disposes of the belongings of individuals experiencing homelessness. In addition, the investigation will assess the city and Phoenix PD's systems and practices for responding to people with disabilities. The investigation will include a comprehensive review of Phoenix PD's policies, training, supervision, and force investigations, as well as Phoenix PD's systems of accountability, including misconduct complaint intake, investigation, review, disposition, and discipline. This investigation is a double-edged sword because, as much as it's good that the Phoenix Police Department could possibly be held accountable for civil rights violations and misconduct, it's made it impossible to get any information directly from the Phoenix PD. They're currently being investigated by the DOJ, and little old me comes along asking questions about one of their detectives making a huge mistake during an investigation. You think they're telling me anything? No. That's okay, though. It's unlikely that they would have told me anything that was remotely true anyway. Ryan Waller was born February 12, 1988, in Phoenix, Arizona. They eventually moved to an area about 40 minutes north of downtown Phoenix. Here's Ryan's father, Don Waller, discussing the case with me at his home in Phoenix. Uh, we lived in Phoenix. I actually bought this house on his 10th birthday, believe it or not. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'll never forget the day I bought it. Yeah. And then, uh, so you guys lived out here. He uh, went to high school out here, graduated. Correct. What did he, what did he want to do after high school? What was his... He... Actually, he was a great guitar player. He yep. taught himself how to play guitar, and he was a uh, guitar. guitar wizard. <laughs> yeah. He could hear a song and five minutes later be playing it, so he yeah. wanted to get into music. Oh, that sounds cool. Was he going to go to school for that, or was he, what was his play? Is he trying to form he, he a thought, band? Or? Yeah, he, he thought he'd make it big. Yeah? yeah was he, he playing a in a band? Um, just with friends and stuff yeah. like that. Nothing you ever play any shows or anything? No. No? No, oh. just friendly shows. But. That sounds fun. 
In December of 2006, Ryan had recently graduated from high school and was playing music with friends. Ryan started teaching himself to play guitar when he was 11 years old and had dreams of making it big in a rock band. He had been dating Heather Kwan for about six to eight months and the couple had recently moved in together. They had known each other since they were little kids having lived in the same neighborhood at one point in time. Heather was born on April 10, 1985 and was 21 years old at the end of 2006. She was attending the University of Arizona and wanted to get into law school, hopefully becoming a prosecutor one day. In another world, Heather could have been putting away people like Richie and Larry Carver. Larry and Richie Carver's lives leading up to the events of December 25, 2006 were not those of upstanding citizens. Larry was arrested at least six times prior to December of 2006 for domestic violence, assault, and assaulting a police officer. He was in contact with police at least twice as many times over the years for other assaults, threatening people, misconduct involving weapons, and theft. Richie's record is even longer and started back when he was in middle school. Assaults, aggravated robbery, running away from home, and making threatening phone calls. He was arrested for aggravated assault against his father in 1998. Through 1999 and early 2000, he was involved in multiple other assaults. In 2000, Richie committed armed robbery. Richie, he's 24 years old at this time. He has an extensive juvenile history, but back when he was 17 years old, there was a man stopped at an intersection in a neighborhood, and he walked up to a car and he stabbed a man in the chest with a knife. He stole the guy's wallet from the guy and the guy's CDs, and he tried to make it home. I don't know if he made it home or not, but he ended up getting caught, and he served almost four years in prison. So we had only been out of prison about a year and a half up until this time. So this guy is already an ex-con who obviously has shown that he has no regard for human regard life. For, exactly. Right. The records aren't available due to Richie being a minor at the time, but his arrest records do match up with that account. There is an absence of activity between November of 2001 and December of 2005, the time he would have been in prison. While in prison, Richie was charged with promoting prison contraband, a Class II felony, for being in possession of a shank. He was evaluated by a psychiatrist in 2000 who stated, quote, his moral structure is so weak that his internal control mechanism, his conscience, has no influence over his behavior. That is, he is able to violate himself and others with the same ease as he's able to take a drink of water. I would rate the potential for Richie to act out in the future in the high-risk range." End quote. When Richie was released from prison, his criminal record picked right back up. 2005 and 2006 were filled with domestic violence, criminal damage, and assaults. One of the details that's been put out by the media, and I'm guilty of this in my original video, is the idea that Ryan and Richie were roommates at some point. Richie had never been Ryan's roommate. Richie had lived there previously. Previously, right, but when whoever had seen this, and they've got reports just from watching the actual interrogation, at one point the detective says, who is Richie? And Ryan said, he used to live there. And the detective said, was your room roommate? And Ryan said, maybe, or he, maybe he might have been or something like that. Yeah. He says, how long, how long did he live with you for? And Ryan said, I don't know, a week maybe, you know, but that was just. Right. And when did Richie live with you? I don't know, like a week, man. When? When? I don't know. Like a week ago, two weeks ago, a month ago? Maybe. Unfortunately, a lot of the information released by the media was taken from this interrogation video where Ryan is giving answers while he has a traumatic brain injury. The truth was that Richie had been a previous tenant before Ryan and Heather rented the house with one other roommate named Alicia. Ryan also says at one point that he bought the house. You know what happened in your house last night? Mm-hmm. Is that house yours? Mm-hmm. Yours or your parents? Mm -hmm. Mine. You bought that house? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ryan was renting the house. Richie was the previous tenant, and he was around while Ryan started moving in. I'll backtrack a little bit. They talk about a previous confrontation that they had had. Mm -hmm. One, after Richie had moved out, he had come there twice to ask if any mail had gotten forwarded or that had come there that didn't get forwarded. Mm -hmm. But there was one time, this is maybe a month before, just, just a couple weeks after he moved out, that it was sometime in the middle of the night, Ryan and his friend, and they heard a noise from the outside, and they went in the backyard, and Richie was in the backyard, 
And he said that they asked him what the hell he was doing in the backyard, and, and he had an excuse that when he lived there, he had an iguana that escaped, a four-foot iguana, and he was coming in the backyard because the thing came out at night and was seeing if he could find the iguana. Yeah. So he may have been planning to a robbery then or a case in the place out then, but what happened was when Ryan was moving in, they saw his guitars. He had a nice guitar collection, computer, and just nice things. So they thought that Christmas Day they needed money for whatever. They thought, hey, this is the greatest plan ever. As long as we don't leave any witnesses, we'll never get caught. Because if any DNA were to come out of the house, like handprints or hear anything, of course it's going to be in the house. The guy used to live there. So the guy, by living in the house, the old houses, they have the sliding glass door that have that hook like that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a broomstick in the frame, yeah. You can lift up the frame and it comes right off the hook. Well, they were both sitting on the couch Christmas Day watching a movie and he heard this loud noise and he said he got up off the couch, turned the corner, and him and his dad were already in the door. Richie enlisted his father, Larry, to help him rob Ryan's house on Christmas Day. It's possible that they thought nobody would be home since younger people tend to go spend time at a relative's house on Christmas Day. But just in case, they brought guns with them. One of the incorrect details was that Ryan had a lot of guns and that's what the Carvers were looking to steal. Ryan had one handgun that he had received from his grandfather, but it was not used during the incident, nor was it stolen. It was recovered by police after Ryan had already been cleared of the crime. I heard you have a lot of guns in your house. Mm -mm. No? Mm -mm. Well, you know we're gonna look. Mm -hmm. Again, the details from the interrogation were passed around like a game of operator, and eventually the reports began saying that Ryan had a lot of guns at his house, but he didn't. Sometime between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. on December 25, 2006, Richie and Larry Carver popped the latch on the sliding glass door on the back of Ryan's house and they shot both Ryan and Heather twice in the head. They stole guitars and electronics. The exact items that were stolen weren't able to be listed accurately due to Ryan's brain damage after the shooting and the items were never recovered. I found no evidence that the Phoenix police ever attempted to recover the items that were stolen from Ryan's house. Ryan and Heather were supposed to go to Don's house to have Christmas dinner with his family. Don had called Ryan before dinner, but the call went to voicemail. When the family was ready to sit down to dinner, Don called again but still got his son's voicemail. Now, having not heard back from Ryan over the course of dinner, Don called again, but when he didn't get an answer, he drove to his son's house to check on him. They knocked on the front door, but didn't get an answer, so they called 911 to request a welfare check. It was absolutely bizarre timing, but the original, we, we got there at 10 to 8, and got there, knocked on the door, no response, so called the police and figured we were going to do the right thing. And, said um, worried about her son he hadn't shown up for Christmas dinner um, had tried to call him before dinner during dinner after dinner and after dinner I just said something's got to be wrong so we went to his house and he had just moved in a month and a half before and he had the garage door closed so I wasn't even sure if he was home or not but we knocked on the door and everything no response so I called the police and said hey you know we're worried about our son this isn't like him he's not the type of kid that would be passed out drunk or something like that and just want to make sure that you know everything's okay and um, you just talked to a dispatcher at that time, so the dispatcher said, okay, we'll have an officer get back with you. So we made the call at 10 to 8, so it was about three and a half hours later, this is 11.30 or so, that an officer finally calls and we tell him what's going on. And they said, okay, we'll come out to the house. So in between that time that we made the original call, we had gone and got some coffee and sometime in that period, um, Alicia had come home. So after we got back the second time, we were there and the police came back or when we called them they said we'll come out to the house so a half hour later two patrol cars show up and so the officers out in front of the house along with us and they knocked on the doors and windows and she was home and back in her bedroom but she didn't realize we were there earlier trying to knock and get in it and she just figured ryan would get the door through unfortunate timing alicia had come home during the 10 to 15 minutes that the wallers had gone down the street to get some coffee when they arrived back at the house, they didn't know she was there. It wasn't until 11.30 p.m. that an officer finally called the Wallers back regarding the welfare check. They said they would be there at about midnight. Right there was four hours where Ryan could have been at the hospital being treated. But that was only the first delay. When police arrived, they didn't get an answer, so they tried to look into the windows. While we were all standing in front, 
there were vertical blinds that Ryan had, and there was a fan on, and the blinds were going back and forth real slow like this, and we're all standing there in this cup like this with the flashlight looking through the blinds as they're moving. He said, oh, this doesn't look good. I can see a body. And so right away they made us leave the house and the front of the house, and they didn't go in the house right away. They had to get a search warrant. It took about 54 minutes, almost they an hour. Did you get a search warrant for a welfare Be check? Because being a rental house and wasn't his house for some reason, you know, it, it, the whole thing was ridiculous. But when the police arrive anywhere, if they look into a residence and see a body they believe to be injured or unresponsive, whether it's owned or rented, they have the legal ability to enter that house by any means in order to possibly save that person's life. It's called exigent circumstances, and it's specifically intended for this exact situation. Never in any case I've ever researched have I heard a story where an officer saw an unresponsive body inside a house during a welfare check, and then spent nearly an hour getting a search warrant before entering the home. There's another hour Ryan could have been at the hospital being treated. I've written about a case where officers smelled something funny during a welfare check, so they entered the house. Then, they still didn't rush in to attempt to save the unresponsive person they had seen through the window. They called out a department locksmith to pick the lock on the front door. When that was unsuccessful, they moved around to the back of the house and tried to pick a lock on one of the back doors. The house had two back doors, a vinyl slider that entered into the kitchen, and a single door that entered into the master bedroom. When police started trying to pick the lock on the back door, Ryan heard the noise and opened the door. There's now 10 police cars on the scene and a helicopter flying overhead. And they go into the, they go into the house, and for the last 53 minutes, hour or so, I'm crying thinking that's my son's body that they see. Right. And they go into the house, and well, Three minutes later, they come out with somebody in handcuffs, and I wasn't sure with my son because after they made us leave the front of the house, they put crime scene tape up from the house on either side of him. He's at the very end of a cul-de-sac, so we were maybe 50, 75 feet back, and I was on one side of the cul-de-sac, and his mother was on the other side, and as they're bringing this person out, I could see the side of whoever's face, whoever they were bringing out, I could see there was damage to the face, and his mom that was on the other side, she said, that's Ryan. And so as they put him in the police car, I tried to go into the police car and this officer comes up and he says, don't you dare go near that car. And I'm crying, I'm saying, sir, I just wanna see if my son's okay and what's going on. And he yells at me, we're doing an investigation, you stay away from that car. And I tried to take another step towards the car to go see him, because I'm very upset, obviously. And the officer steps in front of me, chest bumps me, and he says, take another step, take another step. And he's taunting me, and here I'm crying. I'm a you know, grown man, I'm crying because I worried about my son. So I step back, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm not gonna go to jail on Christmas night, you know, and he's in the police car. So about five minutes later, a fire truck and an ambulance pull up, and they go into the house, and come out of the house maybe five, 10 minutes later, and they drive off, and Ryan's still sitting in the police car, and nobody looked at him, but I'm thinking, well, that's a good thing. They're not taking anyone to the hospital. I don't know Heather's dead inside the house at all. I know nothing like that, but um, they drive off, and then I get an officer's attention, and I said, sir, will you please just let me see my son? I wanna see if he feels okay, and he says, your son's fine, he just has a black eye. The paramedics went directly into the house and confirmed that Heather was dead. They didn't check on Ryan at all. They just got back in their vehicles and left. The Wallers were told to go home because it would be hours before they would be able to talk to their son. Ryan had been handcuffed and placed in a patrol vehicle at about 1 a.m. He sat there for about four hours until the lead detective on the scene, Detective Paul Dalton, told an officer to take Ryan to the station. He was photographed and then put into an interrogation room where the infamous video was made. This is the video that most people have seen. In case you haven't, Detective Dalton interrogates Ryan as a suspect while he currently has a bullet lodged in his brain. Ryan immediately starts acting odd and giving answers that don't make sense.
Before Dalton enters the room, Ryan takes it upon himself to put the handcuff on his own wrist. Nobody seems to question that, and maybe Dalton assumed a different officer cuffed him to the table, but an experienced detective should have picked up on his behavior. What's the um, highest grade you went through school? I don't know. I don't know. You don't know what the highest grade you went through? Eighth? You, eighth grade? Did you graduate? Yeah. Did you, do you have a GED? I don't know. You don't uh, know what? I don't know. I don't know. I just want to go home. Oh, you're, you're not going to go home right now. So what? What's the highest grade that you completed? B? No. Not, not grade, as in letter grade. I'm asking, did you graduate high school? No. And the highest you went was eighth grade? Mm hmm. Yep. Do you know how to read and write, Ryan? Yeah. It's painfully obvious that something is wrong with Ryan. He continually says he doesn't know the answers to simple, non-incriminating questions. Dalton instantly takes the position that Ryan is just being evasive because he's trying to not get caught for killing his girlfriend. Seriously, when he's asked what the highest grade he completed was, Ryan answered B. It's clearly not evasive behavior. It's head injury behavior. Like this. What happened to your face? I don't know. You told the officer just a few minutes ago that someone hit you. Do you remember who hit you? Um, I don't know. I think it was Heather. Why would Heather hit you? I don't know. It was an accident. I forgot why. What was an accident? Heather's last name? No. What was an accident? Heather hitting me. What did she hit you with? Her hand and the eye. Did you guys have an argument? Not really, no. Not really? Uh-uh. What happened for her to hit you in the eye like that? She just hit me on accident. She was giving Christina a head. She was what? She was helping Christina with her hair or something. I don't know. Who's Christina? She's on the couch. Christina's on the couch? Dalton asked what was an accident, and Ryan said Heather's last name? He follows that by saying Heather was giving Christina head, then corrects himself that Heather was helping Christina with her hair, Within the first 20 minutes of Detective Dalton's interrogation, Ryan says he doesn't know what happened to his eye, Heather is Eric's girlfriend, he doesn't know who Alicia is, then Heather hit him in the eye, Heather is his girlfriend, then Alicia hit him in the eye. The injury to Ryan's brain has obviously affected his memory. He's accessing memories and placing them in incorrect scenarios or he's accessing the wrong memory for the situation. At the end of the interrogation, Ryan mentions that he was born in Michigan. He wasn't. Dawn explained that Ryan was born in Phoenix, at the same hospital where he would be ultimately treated for his gunshot wounds. Dawn, his father, was born in Michigan, and it seems like Ryan is accessing that memory and describing it as his own birth. He's clearly accessing memories of Heather doing someone named Christina's hair and putting it into the spot where his memory of December 25th should be. He also shows signs of aphasia. Aphasia is when you think of a word, but your mouth says something else, and as far as you know, you said the word that was in your head. Like, I say crayon, but my brain, as far as I know, said water. It could be single words here and there, or every word you say. Someone with severe aphasia might say, empty full or table side chess, and in their head, they said, how are you doing today? This can be triggered by a variety of reasons, but head trauma and brain injury is one of them. 
With time, it seems that Ryan is able to start sorting out the memories and finally starts telling the detective what really happened. Well, these people came over. Richie and his dad. With shoot and arrow, bow and darts. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They hit me and her with those. That's it. And the Heather wasn't there. And Eric wasn't there. It was just me and Heather. What was there? You and Heather were there. And then what happened? And that's it. Richie and his dad tried to break in to the back. Richie and dad? His dad? Mm hmm. Who's Richie? I don't know. Well, you obviously know him. You know his name by Richie. He used to live there. Was he a roommate of yours? He used to be. And they. They hit you and. They hit you? Yeah. Now it's Richie that hit you? Not Heather? No, Richie and his dad. Richie and his dad. They hit you? Yes. Why? Because they're trying to get their stuff. I don't know why. And they had some kind of bow and arrows? Mm hmm. They each had two revolvers and they didn't let off any shells. Okay, you just said they had bow and arrows. Now they have revolvers? That's what I meant. They had revolvers. They have revolvers? Yes. And then what happened? And then they shot us with those. They shot both of you? Yeah. Where'd they shoot you at? I got shot in the eye. You I got think. shot in the eye? I think so. With a revolver? I think. I don't know, man. I don't know. Fuck. Then what happened? I don't know. You don't know a lot, Ryan. I don't, man. I really don't. This is the first time that Ryan mentions Richie as a roommate, but you'll notice that it's Dalton that makes that suggestion first. Ryan just agrees. This is also a good example of aphasia. Ryan is thinking revolver, but his mouth is saying bow and arrow. It doesn't help at all that Detective Dalton is a horrible interrogator. He starts asking Ryan questions about Alicia, but he's calling her Ashley. You know Ashley. She's your roommate, right? Mm -mm. She stays in the next room next next to you. No. No? Never Who is did. she then? His daughter. Whose daughter? Richie's dad's daughter. Is 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 Ashley? Mm-hmm. Richie's dad's daughter. Richie's dad's daughter is Ashley. Mm-hmm. Man, I swear, I don't know. I just want to go home and go to sleep, man. I don't know. Okay. She came home at 9.30 and you answered the door. And you were look, look like that at 9.30 at Christmas Day. For Ashley? Ashley came home. Okay. You let her in. All right. I don't remember. I don't know. Dalton is frustrated because Ryan is claiming to not know who his own roommate is, but he can't even bother to get her name right. No, Ryan has no idea who Ashley is, you dope. And since Ryan has brain damage, he starts putting random details together and says that Ashley is Richie's dad's daughter. Don told me that Ryan has a stepsister named Ashley, so he's connecting the name Ashley to being someone's daughter, but he's putting the information in the wrong places. And Detective Dalton still doesn't realize that Ryan needs medical attention. He still thinks he's some hardened criminal who's trying to get away with murder. You're telling me, you're, you're all over the board here, number one. You're saying bows and arrows, you're saying revolvers, and you're saying some other thing, and they, you're saying they shot you in the eye. Okay? They shot you with a revolver in your eye. Yes. And that's Is it? it a BB gun? No, it was a real gun, man. It was just a if revolver. They shot you in the eye with a revolver. You wouldn't be talking to me right now. How do you know? It was most likely you'd be dead. That's what I thought too, man. I really don't know. Okay. I really don't know and I just want to go back to sleep and try to go back to bed. You're not going back to bed. Okay. Detective Dalton puts his foot in his mouth by telling Ryan that if he had been shot in the eye with a revolver, he'd probably be dead. 
Well, he might be soon if you don't get him to the hospital. Finally, Detective Dalton pulls his head out of his ass and realizes he's a moron. Let me see your nose. Put your, put, your legs, put your legs down. Put your legs down. Bring, bring your face closer. Oh, my head hurts. Okay. Yeah, be, be right back. Dalton calls in the fire department who look at Ryan and take him to the hospital. During this time, Don is still at his house, wondering what the hell is going on with his son. He has no idea that Ryan is the suspect in a murder. He had no idea that Ryan had been interrogated. He doesn't get any news for about three hours. 7.04 in the morning, the phone rings in at St. Joseph's Hospital telling me he's in critical condition with a bullet in his brain. So I get to the hospital and, of course, he's in bad shape and... Um, they can't operate on him right away um, because he has an infection that has set in because the bullet had gone into his nose and I guess may have taken some of the sinus loose right. up in his brain. So an infection started. So they couldn't operate on him, on him right away. So he they had to relieve the pressure on his brain. So they weren't able to to do the brain surgery until December 28th, which is okay. about three days later. Yeah, because they had to get the infection done right, and yeah, yeah. the antibiotics. Yeah. Ryan was in critical condition and should have gotten medical attention immediately, but now that he's in the hospital, all of his injuries are discovered, including one that didn't come from the gunshot. He had a bullet in his brain, six pieces of his eye socket, which was called a blowout on the eye socket, but six pieces of his eye socket were up in his brain. He had a fractured skull. He had a shot in the side of the head that just took part of the skull away, didn't penetrate the brain, and then he had a broken jaw. And the broken jaw, when I got to the hospital and found all his injuries, everything is done up here, but the jaw is broken down here, and I had asked the surgeon, how did his jaw get broke? And the surgeon didn't have an expla explanation. He just said, I have no idea, but it's not from the gunshot, because everything is up here in his head. Well, in looking at the police reports, it shows that as in the police report and when these officers made these reports you know they filed them when they were off their shift so at the time these officers are filing the reports in their mind ryan is the killer so they're not trying to hold anything back right. so they sort of implicate themselves because in one of the officers reports he says that as they go to the back door that ryan's at the back door and they're, they're yelling at him get on the ground get on the ground and ryan's standing there saying, what's going on, what's going on? And the officers say that Ryan's not responding to their commands, so the officers said that they led him to the ground. Well, they don't lead anyone to the ground, they slam people to the ground. Right. So anyways, in the report it says that now Ryan is laying on the ground, his hands are underneath his waist, which also tells me if you're going to the ground and you're getting led to the ground, you're gonna go like that to break your fall so your head doesn't hit the ground. Correct. If your hands are underneath the waist, you're going down to the ground. Face so yeah. now Ryan is laying on the ground, his hands are underneath his waist, and the officer is yelling, get your hands behind your back, and Ryan's not responding, just saying, what's going on? And so the officer says that I took my thumb to his left jaw and there's a technique that they're trained to use that there's a pressure point that they can push a pressure point, which they can do that to make you succumb to what they're trying to get you to do. So the officer says he used this technique until his hands were brought behind his back and handcuffed and they mentioned his left jaw. Well, Ryan says the, that the officer punched him in his jaw, but it goes to show you that whether he used the pressure point or he punched him, that they broke Ryan's jaw. So not only had Ryan been shot twice in the head from these guys and survived, but now he's getting punched in the face by officers and slammed to the ground while he's got serious brain yeah. damage and catastrophic damage to his brain. Yeah. The minute that the Phoenix Police Department came into contact with Ryan, they believed that he was a murder suspect. Even though he had injuries prior to their arrival, they slammed him to the ground, cuffed him, got him no medical attention, and interrogated him. Now, I understand that you need to assume that anybody could be a suspect, but people are innocent until proven guilty, and even guilty people have rights to medical treatment when they're injured. Something that's proven in this photo of Larry Carver in a hospital gown, because when police attempted to arrest him, he ran and they sent the dog after him. Then, they took him to the hospital and got him treated for his injuries. Ryan didn't get that, and the Phoenix Police Department knew that they had messed up. 
Ryan spent 35 days in the hospital, during which time nobody from the police department came to check on Ryan or ask him any questions about the shooting. During that entire time, though Ryan had specifically told Detective Dalton that Richie and his father had shot him and Heather, they made no attempts to locate either of the men. Richie, who used to live in that house, who had a very extensive criminal record, would not have been hard to track down. Then locating his father would have been just as easy, but they didn't. Two people who had murdered a young woman who was just laying on the couch napping and attempted to murder a young man, then stole his belongings, were just out on the street, living their lives. The Phoenix Police Department had no problem with that. It wasn't until Ryan had been home from the hospital for three days that someone came to interview him. It wasn't Detective Dalton. It was three days after Ryan got home that the detectives came and then they questioned Ryan and then it was four days after they questioned Ryan that they arrested uh, Richie. And Richie had been arrested and then it was maybe oh, seven, eight days later that Richie's mother and the wife of Larry went to detectives and she said, hey, Richie's not the only one involved, my husband's involved and she turned her husband in. And then they had found him a few days later and arrested him. So I think what happened was that she saw that Richie got arrested and thought, hey, that SOB is gonna let our son take the fall for this yeah. and threw the, you know, his own son under the bus. So I think that's why she turned her husband in in the first place. Then she recanted, I believe. Yes, it, it was a year and a half later. They were both gonna get tried in the same murder trial. It was three days before the trial was going to start, and she went to the prosecution and she said, I'm not going to testify against my husband. I'm claiming my spousal privilege rights. And they had to delay everything. So everything got canceled, and then they started a separate trial for Richie that went on a month and a half later. And then that subsequently went on for a few weeks, and they found Richie guilty on all four felony charges, and he's serving life without the possibility of parole. So in the meantime, they had let Larry out because they felt that Ryan's testimony alone wouldn't be enough to get a conviction that they really needed his, Richie's mother and Larry's wife's testimony to get a conviction. Eventually, Richie Carver was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of Heather Kwan and the attempted murder of Ryan Waller. Larry's punishment was not as easy. Larry's wife, Cheryl Carver, originally turned him in, most likely in retaliation for letting her son take the fall for the murder. She eventually recanted her statement, and Heather's family helped push through what became known as Heather's Law, which would allow an exception to marital privilege when one spouse voluntarily provides police with information about their spouse's involvement in a serious crime. Larry was finally sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in 2012. Detective Dalton was no longer on the case. The new detective, Detective Porter, who interviewed Ryan 38 days after the shooting had happened, said that Dalton had a family emergency, and at a different time in court, someone said that he had been put on another case. Their stories didn't match. The main point was that they wanted to separate Dalton from Ryan in an attempt to distance themselves from the massive failure on the part of the Phoenix Police Department. This was not the only thing they would do to attempt that. They also tried to claim that the shooting happened on December 23rd. This was an effort to put more time between Ryan being shot and Ryan being treated, time that was not the police department's fault. If Ryan was shot on the evening of December 25th, then almost the entire delay in treatment was caused by the Phoenix Police Department. If he had been shot on December 23rd, there would have been up to a 48-hour delay in Ryan's treatment, which was not their fault. The problem was that Ryan was shot on December 25th and the police department knew it. Uh, on December 23rd, Ryan was here most of the day because I was remodeling my bathroom and he was re helping me remodel my bathroom. And he left the late afternoon of December 23rd and had gone home. And I told him, you know, don't forget Christmas dinner, Christmas night and everything was fine. I didn't talk to him on the 24th, but on the 25th is when I tried to call him for dinner. So on the original autopsy report, it has shown that Heather had died between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. December 25th. And I told you, we got there at 10 to 8 originally. So it was a precise three-hour time frame that they gave us her date of death. And then it was maybe a month and a half, two months later, they came back and they said that, no, she passed away on the 23rd. But they're only going with that because that's the last time that anybody had contact with them but 
in my mind, it's not unusual for somebody not to talk to somebody, you know, right. it just doesn't mean that. So they had ordered a pizza that night and had pizza, and the very last person that had actually clean was a pizza delivery person. So they're trying to say it happened right after the pizza delivery person had gone there sometime that night. But Ryan himself said it was Christmas Day. The roommate that came home, I don't even have her report, she said that she's pretty positive that this must have happened Christmas Day. So I'm thinking that the police just changed the timeline because the more that they can further themselves as far as when this happened and when they got into the hospital, then it's less off of them. Heather's original autopsy listed her time of death as between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. on December 25th, 2006. That's why that's the date that's listed in her obituary and on her tombstone. The time of death on her autopsy was later changed to reflect the possibility that she died on the 23rd. The night that Ryan was arrested, his roommate, Alicia, was also interviewed. Fortunately for her, it seems like they didn't assume she was also responsible for Heather's murder. Alicia said that she had just come home that evening, which would have been while the Wallers were out getting coffee, and she went straight to her bedroom. She didn't see Heather or Ryan when she came in, but she assumed that they would have been shot that day, the 25th. Then there are Ryan's injuries. These, these are some of the pictures that they, they took of Ryan. These are their pictures. And one of the things that... that a surgeon told us that these weren't two-day-old injuries because you can tell by the, the by in the color picture you can see by the damage. But see the rawness of this stuff here. Yeah. This stuff here, if if this was a couple days old, that would be scabbed over. That would be more than that, and that's the giveaway right there. You know, not only the coloring, but right there, this that that wouldn't be that light in color if those were okay. older injuries. Plus, he still wouldn't be bleeding out of his eyeball. The interrogation footage is grainy and you can find a couple of pictures online, but Don had all of the pictures that the police took when Ryan got to the station. They have close-ups of the wounds and you can see the fresh internal skin in the gunshot wound in his nose. There's no scabbing or healing on the wounds. They are not two and a half day old wounds. Detective Dalton makes it clear during Ryan's interrogation that he knows the shooting happened on December 25th. Remember, this interrogation happened the morning of the 26th. What happened last night? Do you know what happened in your house last night? What happened with you and Heather last night? And why would they come on Christmas Day? Due to the negligence of the police, Ryan and Don sued the city of Phoenix and the police department. They felt that they were owed some compensation, most importantly for delaying Ryan's treatment of a gunshot wound to the head. There's no way of knowing how different Ryan's life could have been if his treatment hadn't been delayed by six hours. The Phoenix Police Department refused to take responsibility. First, Detective Dalton gave a deposition that included almost exclusively lies. The lawyer, Mr. Geisler, asked Detective Dalton if there was any particular procedure for their department for handling an injured suspect. Dalton claims that there's no standard and it's a judgment call on the part of the contacting officer. Dalton goes on to say, quote, I would determine their state of mind. In this particular case, Mr. Waller is answering my questions in the proper manner that I would expect him to, end quote. Oh, really? Do you have a girlfriend? Mm -hmm. No? Do you, know, you know a girl named Heather? Mm-hmm. Do you know Heather's last name? Mm-hmm. What is Heather's last name? Um, the one that lives there right now? I guess, I don't know. If her name's Heather, what's her last name? Um... I don't know which name she's trying to use as her last one. She's trying to have a real last as her nickname, so I don't know. What nickname does she go by? Probably wants the last name, Kaiman. Kaiman? How would you spell that? With a K or a C? K. Keep going. I don't know. How old is Heather? 16 or 17. Is she a white girl? Yeah.
How did you meet Heather? I've known her since school. Okay. I don't know. You just known her from school? She used to be a business name. I don't know. She used to be do a business name? She used to be in my book named with business name. Oh, okay. She used to be in the class, your business class? Mm-hmm. Yeah, those seem like perfectly reasonable answers. Dalton also makes this claim, quote, Again, I noticed an injury to his eye and that was it. Like what I would call a swollen black eye, an old injury. And at the time, I didn't deem it necessary for him to have any kind of medical attention, end quote. Except this is from before the interrogation happened, while someone was photographing Ryan's feet. All right, do I get to go home? Should go to the doctors where you should go. Me? Yeah. Why? Is that? Yeah. Is it bad? I'd say that's really bad. I just want to go to sleep. That's it. No, that's... If, you have a, if you have a concussion, you don't need to sleep. That's what the doctors will say. So. Detective Dalton says in his deposition that he makes the call as to whether or not the suspect's injuries are an emergency or not. If they aren't, he does the interrogation before he gets the person in question medical treatment. Mr. Geisler asked, quote, how do you make that determination as to whether an injury is an emergency, end quote. Dalton responded, quote, obviously for me, it would be unconsciousness, belated answers to my questions, Reasonably, looking at the injury, obviously. He wasn't bleeding. It was scabbed. It was just my opinion. At first, it was a black eye. End quote. These are the pictures that were taken immediately before Ryan was interrogated by Detective Dalton. This is exactly what Dalton saw while he was interrogating Ryan. Actually, what Dalton saw was better than these, because these are pictures of a photocopy. Dalton could see Ryan's injuries better than this. Not bleeding? Does this look scabbed over? No, it doesn't. It's a fresh gunshot wound, just like this fresh gunshot wound. Detective Dalton was questioned by a different lawyer, Miss Bell, who asked him about what happened after the fire department arrived at the interrogation room. She asked, quote, Did they say anything to you regarding their observations of Mr. Waller and his injuries? End quote. Dalton responded, quote, They didn't think he was shot. My watching them, they said, you know, there's nothing really wrong with him. I said, well, you guys have to take him out of here, end quote. Let me give you guys a little tip about lying. Don't do it about something that's been recorded. Dalton's answer was a complete fabrication. The entire interaction between Ryan, Dalton, and the fire department was recorded. That recording is readily available. I won't play the entire thing because it's about three minutes long, but at no time during the recording do the firefighters say that there's nothing wrong with them. Actually, as they leave with Ryan, they say this. Where are we going? We're going to go to the hospital. Get checked out, bro. You look like you got shot right in the face. Detective Dalton goes on to claim that he had followed up at the hospital later and the doctor told him that it looked like he was only an assault and that Ryan was being rude to the nurses and staff. That's most likely another fabrication. Don said he went to the hospital as soon as he got the call and never saw anyone from the Phoenix Police Department. Ryan was immediately determined to have been shot twice in the head. There is almost no possible way that a doctor at the hospital told Detective Dalton that because Detective Dalton is a liar. He has a history of lying about details of cases in order to get his way. After interest in the Ryan Waller interrogation video started picking up, a young man, whose full name I won't use, but he goes by Roman, commented on one of the videos that he had also had a negative run-in with Detective Paul Dalton of the Phoenix Police Department. I was able to do a recorded phone interview with Roman, and he had an interesting story to tell. I was at a, I was at a house party. Um, you know, just doing the, the normal teenage thing. I was getting ready to, I was about one week from going to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia to go to basic training. And, you know, they're having a party for me and some, an, an, an individual and his friends came and they crashed it and they started shooting. And, you know, I ended up firing back and I ended up uh, 
shooting the 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 driver of the vehicle and the main aggressor in the head and he ended up passing away um i ended up explaining this uh to dalton i told him exactly what happened and literally the first thing he told me was i don't believe you he's like i think you're a liar and i don't believe you and then he's like what gang are you from and this and that and i was just like gang i was like i never said i was from a gang and he goes oh so you're telling me that you went and you just shot these two people for no reason no rhyme or reason i don't believe that and i was just like i never said i shot them for no reason i've told you that they came and they tried they, they crashed this party they started a fight they pulled out weapons they started shooting and you know i ended up firing back and you know like i said right away dalton didn't even care he didn't even want to hear the story he he had his own story made up in his mind and was just like well i think this is what she did and this is what i think really happened and i think you're just trying to cover your tracks and i was just like are you are you serious? And he was just like, yes, that's exactly what I think. And I was just like, well, I don't know what you want me to say here. I was just, I can't, I can't lie and make up a situation for something that didn't happen. I was like, I don't know what you want me to say. This is what happened. That's all I can tell you. This incident took place on March 8th, 2012. Roman was 19 years old and legally owned the firearm. At this time, Arizona had both the Castle Doctrine and the Stand Your Ground Law in place. The Castle Doctrine allows people to use deadly force when defending their own property, and the Stand Your Ground Law means you don't have to attempt to retreat before you use deadly force to defend yourself. Both of these laws should have cleared Roman, but Dalton wanted him to be guilty. Dalton would go on to perjure himself by saying that the gunmen who arrived at the party were only firing in the air and Roman wanted to shoot and kill them. An investigation would reveal over 100 shell casings at the scene, less than 10 were from Roman's gun. They also pulled numerous bullets out of walls that belonged to the offending shooters, proving that they weren't shooting in the air. Clearly, Roman must have been a bad kid with a rap sheet a mile long, right? He thought I was just a gangbanger and this and that, and I was just like, I graduated with a 3.8 GPA, I graduated with all A's, I was in the... the the JROTC program from my freshman year all the way to the senior year. I broke state. I broke state records. Um, like I've done so much in my in my high school career that it was ridiculous. I, I was a. I got first place national physical fitness uh, uh, test four years in a row. I got two uh, certificates signed by uh, President Barack Obama and two signed by Bush. And so, yeah. and and like he didn't know any of that though. So. And so, you know, he was just trying to go blindly and just say, oh, this kid's a gangbanger, this kid's a gangbanger, this kid's a gangbanger, when the whole entire situation it was, it wasn't true. You know, it was the other kids who were the gangbangers, the other kids who were doing all the bad stuff. At the time, I was 19. Roman refused to take a deal, so he sat in jail for two years while he waited to go to trial. During that time, Dalton continued to do whatever he needed in order to put his quote-unquote suspect away. Well... Um, I, obviously I was not guilty. Um, yeah. that's when they found out that he committed perjury and he lied on the stand. And that's when he, uh, he didn't know, but the private investigator had already had, uh, text messages from the victim's brother and his cousin. And during those, those conversations that Dalton didn't know that they were, uh, the phones were being tapped, he was messaging the victim's brother and the victim's cousin. And he literally went into the evidence locker, grabbed the weapon, gave him back, like I said, to that to the kid who was only 15 at the time, and uh, and basically said, I need you guys to get rid of him. Trial starts in September. Jesus and, Christ. Right? And then, and then uh, that, that's, that's probably the only reason I'm, I'm out right now. And, uh, and, uh, after that, after he after he told him uh, to get rid of the weapon, may, maybe a week later the cousin messages him, "It's done," and that's when we're picking. And then that, during that time is when we were uh, doing jury selection. So my lawyer ended up, you know, bringing it up. He goes, "It's, it's funny." He goes, "It's funny you have it. You have this gun. You're waving here to the jury." He goes, "What happened to the other three guns that you collected?" Well, he he said he didn't know, and he was just like, "Oh, you don't know." And he go and he goes. So you're telling me that three guns disappeared off of a lockdown street that was supposed to be locked down? 
And he was just like, oh, well, I, I don't know. And then and he goes, oh, you don't know. He goes, okay, I want to know if you recall these messages. And that's when my lawyer started bringing out the messages and the phones. And then as, as soon as he did that, he refused to answer any question. And then and then after that, he, he just, he, like I said, he refused to answer any questions. He got off the stand, and he never showed up to court ever again. That was the last time I had saw him is when they, when they called him out on his perjury, when they basically said that he lied. And literally, my lawyer even my, my lawyer asked for immediate dismissal at that point. They dismissed all of the charges but one. They wouldn't dismiss one charge of felony disorderly conduct for discharging a weapon within city limits. Because you choose where someone's going to attack you, right? They threatened to take that charge to trial, which would have taken another year plus. So he pleaded guilty to that one charge and got time served. Now, with a felony on his record, he can't join the military. He can't vote, he can't own a firearm, he can't have any federal job. And unlike other people who go to jail and then continue to reoffend, Roman has never been in trouble since. That was the only time, still, and still is the only time, the only incident I've ever had any contact with the police, period. You know, I didn't graduate, like, yeah. and that's what I tried to tell him. I was like, I didn't graduate with a 3.8 GPA just fucking around on the street. I stayed in school, you know, I did extracurricular activities, I did football, I did track, I did, uh, like I said, I did ROTC, I did wrestling, you know, I did so many sports to stay out of trouble. And, and, and I was still trying to stay out of trouble and I was trying to leave and go to the military and, 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 and that was, you know, cut short. Does anybody believe that these are the only two times that Detective Dalton has lied and cheated during a case? What's more likely? that Dalton lied about the details of Ryan's case in 2006 and then just happened to lie about Roman's case in 2012 and has been a perfect cop the rest of the time? Or was this a regular pattern of behavior with Detective Paul Dalton that he was never punished for? The Phoenix Police Department knew he messed up with Ryan. It was shown in court that he had tampered with evidence in Roman's case. But Detective Dalton was allowed to continue doing his job and then he retired. He lives a comfortable life somewhere, sleeping easily at night even though he's ruined countless lives with his misconduct. The city of Phoenix eventually brought in a quote-unquote expert to help in the lawsuit. They found a doctor that said the six-hour delay probably didn't make a difference in his outcome, that he would have had the same damage he had to treatment right away or six hours later. I had paid a $10,000 retainer for a brain surgeon out of Florida that would have came and testified something a lot different. They would have came and said that, hey, when your brain is bleeding, it's swelling. When it's swelling, damage is being caused. Every minute matters. They talk about the first hour being the golden hour. Every minute matters in something like that. And you have to get a surgeon from another state to testify because they won't testify in their own state because it's a conflict of interest. Right. So my, my brain expert specialist would have testified something a whole lot different than what they're. And they found a judge that accepted it and dismissed our case three weeks before the trial was going to start. The case was dismissed and the Wallers could have filed an appeal, but if they did and lost, they would have been liable for all of the city's legal fees. Don had to make the tough decision to not lose everything he had on a case where the deck was so clearly stacked against them. After the shooting, Ryan moved back in with Don and spent the rest of his life dealing with the aftermath. He was like somebody with Alzheimer's. He would tell you the same story over and over again, or he asked you the same question over and over again. He had the worst seizures that you could ever imagine. He had seizure where he, it was on an Easter Sunday, he bit off the whole side of his tongue. He had a seizure where he broke his nose. He had a seizure where his ankle got caught in a headboard and he broke his ankle. He had a seizure on gravel, face down, and every extremity of his body that touched the gravel looked like somebody took a sanding belt to it. Just horrible. He had a seizure in a grocery store, ended up with 40 stitches in his face and his head from his head bound, pounding on the cement floor in the grocery store. So he just had horrible, horrible seizures. You know, there was a medication that helped at he, all? Or? Well, he had medications to help control them, but you know, he still had them regularly. You know, you know. And then ultimately one of the seizures caused him to pass? Right. He had had a seizure, the last one in the grocery store, um, November and it was January 20th that ended up from a brain bleed from a seizure, and I'm sure that that's probably what caused it was the last seizure in the grocery store that caused the bleed. And he hit his head on the ground. Yes. Ryan died on January 20th, 2016. 
he was 27 years old. At that point, since Ryan's death was caused by a condition he had due to the gunshots, Larry and Richie could have been charged with his death. Don said that the family thought about it, but the two were already serving life without the possibility of parole and they didn't want to go through another trial. Now, they just wished that the city of Phoenix and the Phoenix Police Department would take responsibility for the pain and suffering they caused Ryan. That's something that I agreed with Don about and one of the things that really pulled me into this documentary. That and to correct the information that has been swirling around in the media, being reported incorrectly. I want to make sure the information I put out is accurate, and my previous video about this case included many of the incorrect details that are out there. I'm going to clear those up right now. It's been reported most commonly that Richie was previously Ryan's roommate. That's not true. It looks like Richie lived in that same house before Ryan lived there with another young man named Eric. Eric claimed to have kicked Richie out, and then Ryan moved in. After that, it seems that Eric also moved out and Heather and Alicia moved in. Ryan and Richie never lived in that house together at the same time. Another common mistake is that Ryan had a bunch of guns in his house that Richie stole the night they shot Ryan and Heather. Ryan owned one gun that he had gotten as a gift from his grandfather. Don said he believed it was a handgun. It wasn't readily available and seems to have been tucked away somewhere because when police originally searched the house, they found no guns. It wasn't until after Ryan had gone to the hospital and was cleared of the murder that they found Ryan's gun somewhere in the house. That was the only gun he owned. There's been some confusion about whether Ryan lost one or both of his eyes. Ryan was shot in the left eye and he lost that eye permanently. During the surgery, doctors removed both of his eyes but they put his right eye back in and he was able to see out of it. There's also been some mention of Ryan and Richie having some sort of conflict prior to the shooting. It's mentioned somewhere that Richie hit on Heather and that Ryan was pissed about it. According to Don, as far as he knows, Heather had never met Richie. There's also been mentioned that there had been an armed conflict between Ryan and Richie, but that's not true either. In an interview conducted with Eric after the shooting, Eric said he caught Richie sneaking around their backyard once after he had kicked him out. I'm assuming during the same period of time where Eric and Ryan lived in the house together, and Eric claimed to have pointed a gun at Richie and told him not to come back. This could be the armed conflict some people reported. It's also widely reported that Ryan and Heather were shot on December 23rd, but it's very hard to believe that. Ryan and Alicia both said it happened on the 25th. The medical examiner originally placed Heather's time of death on the 25th and Ryan's wounds were not consistent with two and a half day old injuries. The only people claiming the shooting occurred on the 23rd were the police based on when a pizza was delivered. Then when Cheryl Carver turned in Larry, the transcript from her interview mentions three times that she claimed that Larry came home and said he shot Ryan on the 23rd. Then he went to California until the 25th. The last time it's mentioned literally says, quote, Cheryl then clarified that Richie and Larry left their house at about 2000 on the 23rd and arrived back at 2100 hours, end quote. There's a line that specifically points out the day being the 23rd. That just seems shady. Oh, and guess who was involved in this interview? Detective Dalton. So I have absolutely no ability to believe there's any truth to Cheryl's statement. Well, I would hope now, now the city and the police department, of course, is under investigation by the Department of Justice and about a lot of things. And one of the things is, is how they police themselves and handle their own investigations. And of course, they did their own investigation on this and found absolutely nothing wrong. So my hope is that once the Department of Justice comes out, that they're able to come out and say, hey, look, the Phoenix Police Department and the city of Phoenix has had these legal practices that they've been doing. And hopefully we, when this is done and they issue their findings that we're able to go to the courts and say, hey, look, we know we had this case that was dismissed, but we had the deck stacked against us and we didn't have a chance. And we would just like you to look at what we have and just you make a decision. And do you think this should have got dismissed? At the end of the day, Ryan Waller was a victim and he was treated like a criminal. They say that people are innocent until proven guilty, but Ryan was treated like he was guilty immediately. 
Then, even though the Phoenix Police Department knew that Ryan was treated improperly, they completely ignored him and acted like he didn't exist. They ignored him while he was in the hospital, possibly hoping he would die and their problem would be gone. Detective Dalton disappeared until he was summoned to court during the Waller's lawsuit, where he did this. It's the first day of the trial. He walks up and we're in the very front row, of course, and from me to the camera is there where Ritz is sitting with nothing but a 30-inch pony wall between us. But I'm in the first seat here, Ryan's right here, and then Heather's mom, Terry, is right there in the third seat. The detective comes by, walks in front of me, stands in front of Ryan, reaches over and says, good morning, Terry, how are you doing this morning? Shakes her hand, talks to her, doesn't acknowledge Ryan, doesn't acknowledge me, and then walks off. Never has said another word at all. Never. Not like, hey, buddy, how you doing? You know, uh, you know doing all right? Or, hey, you know, I feel bad. I dropped the ball. Nothing. Never even acknowledged us. Just walked by us. Even after it was proven that Ryan was a victim, they treated him like garbage. The biggest priority of the Phoenix Police Department is not to ensure they fix their mistakes. It's to ensure that nobody finds out about them. This is part of the reason that the Phoenix Police Department is currently being investigated by the Department of Justice. Because of the way they treat everyone they come in contact with, suspect or victim, and because of their history of covering up their mistakes and their biased internal investigations. The DOJ is asking people to contact them if you have information about an interaction with the Phoenix PD. They're looking for civil rights violations and police misconduct. They can be reached by email at phoenix.community at usdoj.gov or by phone at 866-432-0335. This information will also be in the show's description. If you have any stories about mistreatment by the Phoenix Police Department, especially by Detective Dalton, please contact the DOJ and let them know. I'm also interested in hearing your stories. You can send them to thisismonsters at gmail.com, or I will have a post on my subreddit, r forward slash thisismonsters, where you can leave your stories. I want to thank everyone who was involved in making this, especially Don Waller and his family. A special thanks to Roman for telling his story, and thanks to the people of Phoenix who are fighting right now to get their police department to start acting ethically and start treating the citizens with respect. Be safe. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.